instead of them doing it, like getting computers to work. Um, they develop emotional dependency that they need someone to take care of them all the time with all this excessive help going on. Medication dependency is not the uh, addiction to medication. No, it's the belief that I can't function unless I take my drug. I get a lot of teens with that belief. I'm frightened to get off the drug because I'll lose all my grades and everything like that. And yes, you will go through rebound and you will go through a period of withdrawal. We'll do wait till the summertime and get you cleaned out so that by fall we can get started on this. And yes, you can stay on your medication until we get to that point if you're that frightened. I'm not going to pull it out from under you. Um, but they have that terrible belief that they have a disease and that they can't function unless they take those drugs. Some of you may be f uh, familiar with contingency contracting. I'm not going to go into that. That's the most cumbersome, non-workable approach uh, that I think is, is known in behavioral circles. I, uh, years ago, began developing the REST uh, program, which is the real economy system for teens. Um, I needed a way to get them under control when they would not communicate. Now, I know that we have represented in the room all kinds of eclectic different forms of therapeutic approaches. Sometimes I think we are actually all saying the same thing in different languages. Really, if you really start looking closely at it. Um, but how do you get them talking and how do you get their behaviors under control? Uh, one of the questions that I was asked is, uh, Dr. Stein, are you only interested in getting their behaviors under control? And the answer is no. The book that's coming out, only the first third is getting their behaviors under control. That's what we're going to talk about. But the rest of uh, the work, the real work, begins by developing parent-child communication, what values to instill, character education, um, how to grow close with your youngster so that you, you as a parent are the actual therapist. You are developing their value structure and belief system so that um, they develop the resistance to all the temptations that are out there today. Let's talk about um, the REST program, which is the how-to part. Uh, basically, in developing this program, which started many years ago when I realized when I first started working uh, as a therapist, I realized I didn't know what the hell I was doing with teenagers. I didn't understand at all. And it was really very torturous sessions. And I began to think, okay, you know, I've been trained in cognitive therapy and behavioral therapy and those kind of things. Surely I can find tools. I went to the library. Um, this was at the University of Memphis, uh, now Mem uh, Memphis State University and uh, went to the library and started to look up for treatments about how to work with teenagers um, and I found nothing, zero. Uh, and then I decided the only way that this was going to be uh, working is I'm going to have to develop the techniques myself. So I began developing them and it's been an evolutionary process. And quite frankly, as, I, as you people give me feedback, I grow. When you tell me what is and is not working and what is not clear and all those kinds of things, I evolve. So this has been an evolutionary process for me. One of the things that happens is parents and teenagers often fight. And they often confuse the issues over what I call home issues versus life issues. Home issues are those issues of things that occur right there in front of the parent. What are the things that are driving parents up a tree that they don't really need to fight about? The life issues are the things that we talked about which require communication which is their values, what's important to them, uh, things that go on out of sight from the parent, the dangerous world that's out there. My son is 18. He is now living on his own uh, in Manhattan. I, I really feel that I fully trust that he now has all the equipment he needs to function and function well. And uh, I'll explain some of the things that I did. I, you know, this has not been necessary in working with them, but the REST program has been necessary for a lot of the teenagers that I've had as patients. These are the home rules. These are the ways to begin getting them under control, and then we'll tell you how to do the control so that you get them complying. This all started many years ago when I was watching the Today Show, um, which was the clean room, and they had the ever-popular authoritative uh, therapist on, on the TV, and one of the arguments that is um, often made is my teenager's room is a mess. 
And, um, you know, I really, what should I do about it? And the good doctor on the Today Show said, that is their private domain. And if that's the way they want to live, they have a right to live that way. And just shut the door. And I'm thinking, damn, that's my house. And I have a right, I'm the one that pays the mortgage. I have a right to have that room kept the way I want it. That's only a border in my house. He rents space with his life. And I thought that's the most ridiculous thing. And they were confusing that with the issue of their privacy. Privacy is my, my children and I have a rule which I think has always been honored. If a letter is left open, face up, it will not be read without permission. We have honored that and they have learned that as a value. If I go into their room uh, and I see a diary and they both journal, uh, if I see it left open, I will not read it. I have never read it and we trust each other. But I do require that they make their bed every morning and that they clean their room to a reasonable degree. And that's what this is all about. You have to set a specific time to get this done on rule number one so that you don't argue and you don't get into a tussle early in the morning. Uh, usually I suggest five minutes before the school bus comes or before they get into their Rolls Royce and drive to school. <laughs> rule two is kind of interesting. I call it the hygiene rule. I added this rule many years ago when it became stylish to wear studs and pierce everything in your body and then get tattoos all over your body. Um, I teach at a university and uh, I'm amazed at uh, the size of the tattoos on some of the students. You know, and I'm, you, we've all had that thought, don't you know you're going to be middle-aged one day? They don't know that. <laughs> if they keep up the behavior, it may not happen. Um, most teenagers actually engage in really good hygiene practices. Uh, as a matter of fact, they dominate the bathroom too much, getting them out of the bathroom. My older boy, uh, when he would uh, use the shower, would leave no hot water for dad. He wanted to get me mad. <laughs> Just stay in there. So they usually do primp, but this is aimed at the teenager that dresses overly outlandishly so that we can control their dress and appearance to a reasonable degree. I can't define the term reasonable, and as you know, the courts have never successfully de defined the, ter the term reasonable. Um, we don't want them wearing bow ties to uh, school, and uh, unfortunately this gives parents a lot of power, and uh, the, sometimes the parents don't exercise the best judgment, so I have to tell them that you have to be cognizant of what's in style um, and uh, be reasonable in terms of what they're wearing to a degree. I'm not in favor of tattoos, and uh, I had my sons allowed them to get an earring. But beyond that, you know, if they said two, I said, let me put the other earring in. And we'll do it right through the middle of your skull. So uh, one earring is sufficient. Um, rule number three is what chores should we re reasonably expect from a teenager? I'm old. And I'm too tired to do all the housework. And I'm not going to wait on my children hand and foot, which a lot of parents do, especially with both parents working. They come home, they sit in front of the TV, parents come in 6 o'clock, 6.30, whatever, they're dog tired, and the house is a mess while they've been watching Jerry Springer. Why do you think Jerry Springer was on for many years at 4 o'clock in the afternoon? Um, because they captivate the teenage audience, and this is the values that they're learning. I believe that a teenager should have one major chore per day. Uh, I think that's fair. And not to be used as slave labor, but basically to assist in the, in the care of the house. It can be things like cooking an entire dinner. So you come home and it's nice to have a dinner cooked. And helping to uh, clean up afterwards. It can consist of perhaps cleaning a couple of bathrooms. It can consist of dusting the entire house but one major chore per day. And putting out the garbage is not a major chore. So 
I expect, uh, with one exception, and I, the exception I take is the day of worship. For some of you that's Saturday, for some of you that's Sunday, and I think that they basically should be free of a chore on that particular day. I do believe it should be a day of rest. Um, I think it's absolutely important actually to have a day of rest like that. Minor chores are real simple, but minor chores simply means pick up after yourself. Now there will be consequences if you don't do this, and they're going to be pretty dire. So we'll talk about how to control it. The safety issue uh, is, not, is more for us parents. The safety issue, or rule number four, is my daughter, who is now a married adult woman, at the age of 13, um, started a new school. And uh, they were developing or having the day's festivities with a bonfire. And she got invited to go to another party without permission after the school activities. Her mother and I drive up to the school. The teacher comes up to the car and says, um, Dr. Stein, Heidi is OK. What are you talking about? She's been in an automobile accident. What? And um, she's OK. We drove to the scene of the automobile accident, and it was horrible. Uh, the young man driving the car was speeding. Uh, first thing the police officer told me was he was speeding. First thing he, the boy's parents said, the police say he wasn't speeding. And literally, he spun out of control. And one boy, most were not wearing seat belts. And to give you an idea of the G-forces, one boy shot out the back window onto the road. Another one went out the front window onto the road. And the doors kicked open, and two more fell out. They were all over the road. Thank God no other cars came on that road, because they would have gone over the kids. It was behind a blind curve. We sit there, and I don't want to sit there knowing, are my children OK? Now, in those days, we didn't have cell phones. Today, we have cell phones. And both the boys do have cell phones, and they can call in an emergency, uh, et cetera. But I want to know where you're going, who you're going with. You are accountable to me until you leave the nest. Uh, and I have a right to know that, because I don't want to stay up worrying if you're OK. I want to know that you're OK. So that was what the safety rule was for. This is the biggie. Most parents bring their children to them because of verbal abuse. And uh, usually, I see a lot of that. And it's been escalating year after year. I get more and more cases of teenagers that are verbally abusive to their parents. And I hear curse words that are just horrendous. Um,